250 times a week, the news comes first on WNBC 660 New York. Say, gather around, you lovers of fried chicken, for the poultry party of the year. This Tuesday at the Brass Rail Restaurant on 7th Avenue and 49th Street, there opens the Kentucky Chicken Room, a special salon serving a special dish, the first New York presentation of the famous Colonel Sanders Kentucky Fried Chicken. Now, this will be the only main dish served in the Kentucky Chicken Room, a finger-licking chicken creation, the plumpest of pampered poultry prepared according to Colonel Sanders' own recipe, graced with whipped potatoes, country gravy, Shelby County carrot souffle, southern coleslaw, hot biscuits and muffins. The amazingly modest cost will be $1.95 for the whole deal. Drop in Tuesday at the Brass Rail, 7th Avenue and 49th Street for luncheon, dinner, or supper, and meet up with Colonel Sanders' Kentucky Fried Chicken. Journey into Nature. This is the American Museum Hayden Planetarium. Above me are the dots of light that mark what is known of the universe about us. Knowledge gathered for hundreds of years. It is from this point that we will begin our journey into nature. Journey into Nature, a special series of programs produced by WNBC in cooperation with the American Museum of Natural History, an institution dedicated to the search for knowledge in the fields of natural science. Within the many exhibit halls of the museum, you will find accurate representations of what man has learned of himself and the world that surrounds him. Journey into Nature will visit many of the exhibits talk with the staff members and research scientists of the museum in order to capture in sound the wealth of knowledge on display, to bring you the excitement of learning, to explore the wonders of the world. Here now is your host, Kenneth Banghart. Good afternoon. Today marks the 25th anniversary of the American Museum Hayden Planetarium. On this date in 1935, the doors opened on a new world of knowledge, the chief benefactor of the planetarium, Charles Hayden, set down these words in dedicating the planetarium. I believe that the planetarium is not only an interesting and instructive thing, but that it should give a more lively and sincere appreciation of the magnitude of the universe and the belief that a much greater power than man must be responsible for the wonderful things which are daily occurring in the universe. With us this afternoon to mark the anniversary of the planetarium is Mr. Joseph Chamberlain. He's the chairman of the planetarium, and we've asked Mr. Chamberlain to Go back over the past 25 years and pick out the important discoveries that have expanded the astronomer's knowledge of our universe. And tell us how, in these 25 years, the sky shows of the planetarium have reflected the increase in knowledge. We're going to start by going back two and a half decades, back to 1935, back to a time of economic recovery. The years between 1935 and 1945 saw the inactivity of depression replaced by the turmoil of war. Note each of the events of 10 years. Put them on small white cards, shuffle them, and then select at random dates and headlines. 1939, April 30th, and a World's Fair is opened in New York. The products of a century on display. The dreams for a decade to come erected in a New York meadow. Stuck to this card is another marked September the 3rd, 1939, the day World War II started, though few knew it at the time. Here's one labeled March 23rd, 1935. Amelia Earhart solos across the Pacific, one of the many feats performed with the airplane in the adolescence of its development. 1941, third term for Roosevelt. 1943, and a general named Eisenhower takes over command of Anglo-American forces in Europe. August the 6th, 1945, the day a new age of man started in a blast of unbelievable heat and light. Events picked at random 
from a decade of the 20th century. The first decade for a domed building in the shadow of the American Museum of Natural History, the Hayden Planetarium. What were the changes in this decade seen by the staff and the visitors to the planetarium? Mr. Chamberlain, we're going to turn that question over to you. I think I could do the same thing that you have just done. Make a list of the special events in the sky or in astronomy which stand out in our planetarium history. For example, the year 1935, the year in which the planetarium opened, was the year of seven eclipses, which is the maximum number possible in any one year, and uh, doesn't happen very often. Uh, the uh, opening of the McDonald Observa Observatory in Texas came later in the 1930s. Almost every year there was the discovery of a, a new asteroid, and several of the satellites in the solar system have been known just since this planetarium opened. Uh, perhaps the most important of all the events of these ten years was the releasing of atomic energy. Not that that specifically affected this institution, but it gave to all of science a new stature. And I think the planetarium, along with uh, science departments generally across the country, shared in this uh, new respect, in the conviction that, after all, the physicist and the astronomer was doing something useful, that he was able to devise schemes that would lead eventually to such things as uh, revealing the true nature of the atom, and perhaps eventually of, of our being able to put it to some useful purpose. When the war came along, the the planetarium's whole character had to change, along with that of most of the country. Some 9,000 midshipmen were trained in navigation here, and I, I think that we can rightfully claim that the planetarium played a very significant part in the war effort. Uh, astronomically speaking, these were not really exciting years. The great discoveries were yet to come, and yet they were years in which many of our fine astronomers were working hard on, on many different kinds of problems, plugging away in astrophysics mostly, in a direction which uh, uh, came to, brought, brought things to fruition just after the war. Also during this first decade of existence of the planetarium, there were many attempts to provide uh, special courses for, for adults, people who might be interested in navigation, astronomy, meteorology. Unfortunately, there, there was not the, the amount of interest that might have been expected. Several of the navigation courses succeeded rather well, and there were a couple of courses each year, but the, uh, the uh, American citizenry seemed to be much more involved in perhaps getting ready for the war, after, war effort. And uh, uh, in general, the, the activity within the planetarium uh, was not expanding too greatly. The uh, first sky shows were uh, extremely interesting because they, they displayed to the many people who had never before seen a, a Zeiss projector uh, just what the capabilities of this fantastic instrument really were. As most everyone knows by this time, some 10 million Americans have visited the American Museum Hayden Planetarium and uh, many more in the other planetariums of the country. Uh, this is a, a building uh, 75 feet in diameter with a dome on the inner surface of which the skies are reproduced quite realistically. And it is the Zeiss Planetarium Projector that uh, is the agent which permits us to, to paint that sky picture. The um, instrument was on display for many years, and day after day, the show began with uh, sunset, the uh, lecturer proceeded to de describe the many interesting features of the night sky, and the show ended with the sunrise. In the years to come, there was to be quite a change in that particular format. Does that cover now 1935 to 1945 to you satisfactorily? Well, I think we could say a lot more. But <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, let's go on then, Mr. Chamberlain, uh, to, to 1946. Uh, A new decade of peace was foreordained for the world at that time, but 
Of course, as we all know, the crystal was very clouded, and from the haze emerged not peace, but an uneasy truce labeled Cold War. The values of a thermometer were inverted in this decade. The colder the political climate, the closer the world approached a hot war. And in comparatively small tests of strength, ideology fought ideology on the cold hills of Korea or the jungles of Indochina and in the cobbled streets of Singapore and on the boulevard leading to the Brandenburg Gate. Ideology fought ideology, and the earth became a powder keg. And yet in the tension of this time, from 1945 to 1955, perhaps because of it, man did make greater technological progress than he had imagined possible. The speed of sound was eclipsed by a man-made vehicle. We call it X-1. The first flying saucers were seen, so-called. Atomic energy was being harnessed. Antibiotics, a new line of defense against disease, were being developed. In every category of scientific study, some new advancement was made in the years 1945 to 55, a decade of discovery and uneasy peace. And as for visitors to the planetarium, Mr. Chamberlain, how about briefing us on the changes that were seen here at the planetarium in that period? A development, 1947-1948, I think was as of great significance as many of these other non-astronomical advancements that you have just mentioned. That was the opening of the great new observatory on Palomar Mountain, the new 200-inch telescope. It had been under construction for many years, and it had been hoped that it would be available in the 30s. When it uh, finally came into being, it provided for astronomers a, a wonderful new tool, a tool which provided more light-gathering power, an ability to perceive beyond the, the limits uh, which had been available to astronomical researchers up to that time. To put it another way, the universe, as known in the pre-Palomar days, had a diameter of perhaps a million, uh, 500 million light years. But uh, in the 10 years following the opening of that great new telescope, these boundaries have, have advanced almost unbelievably. We believe now that the universe may have a diameter of, of perhaps six or even 12 billion light years. Most of this change in thinking was brought about by this, this 200 inch telescope and by the fine people who were working with it. They were re able to classify the special little type of star known as the Cepheid variable, which is the key to distance in the universe. One of the Palomar astronomers uh, discovered in connection with work on that Cepheid variable that there are very likely two different family groups of stars which were called population one and population two. Became necessary then for anyone doing research in stars to identify first the, the family characteristics of the star with which he was dealing. So you see it almost separated uh, astrophysical research into stars right down the middle. It um, in some ways doubled the the uh, amount of research necessary to learn more about the universe. There are other advances, too. Palomar people were working day and night, but so were many others in many parts of the world. One of the most interesting discoveries to me was that of Dr. George Herbig at Lick Observatory. He had taken plates, star plates, in a particular part of the sky, in the Orion area of the sky, some years ago. In uh, the early 1950s, he took some more star plates of the same part of the sky and saw stars on those new plates that had not appeared on the earlier ones. This suggested the uh, rebirth or the birth of, of stars in this particular part of space. It seems to fill a missing uh, chord in a story of evolution among the stars and many other theoretical aspects of the same story of evolution have been built up in this same decade. At the planetarium, uh, these new advances in astronomy seem to affect our everyday, everyday existence. We, we uh, tried to keep up with uh, changes that were taking place in our science, and uh, it seemed that people shared uh, interest with us in all of these new things. Right after the war, attendance had gone down to an annual level of about 300,000 persons. Within that decade, advanced to almost double that number, to perhaps 600,000 persons per year. 
there was a, a, a new emphasis on uh, things that before had been strictly science fiction. Many of the theories, many of the ideas about what was to come in the future were viewed with skepticism by many before the war and even afterwards. But uh, with some of the new events of this decade up to 1955, many of these things came, came to life. And uh, our corridors, too, where we have our exhibits on astronomical subjects, reflected the advance in our technology and the advance in astronomy concurrently. Well, in other words, an important, a very important ten years, the second ten years in the planetarium's history. Uh, and that leaves us, Mr. Chamberlain, uh, five years to round out this particular quarter of a century, the years uh, between uh, 1955 and today. Twenty-five years to the day when the planetarium first opened. Now, I think that this half decade that we're about to talk about can be summarized in one sound, a rocket leaving Earth. The bonds were broken, the thin whistle of a radio signal sent to man by a product of his own construction, sent to him from a point in the infinite boundaries of space. A huge step had been taken, a tortured leap beyond the pull of Earth's gravity. Yes, this small slice of time, this period 1955 to 1960, has seen the perfection of vehicles that could climb into outer space, that could project a picture of ourselves that we have never seen before. Mr. Chamberlain, this certainly must have caused great changes in the programs here at the Hayden Planetarium. It caused many changes. The most immediate changes came about immediately upon the firing of the first Sputnik. Our switchboards were so flooded with calls that we just couldn't possibly handle them all. We had to hire new people just to answer the many questions that came to us. But uh, it brought about other changes, too. I, I think it caused us on the planetarium staff... Uh, to realize that uh, there was a new seriousness in many of the things going on around us. It caused us to realize that our problems in astronomy were immediate. We became uh, acutely aware, uh, and this too, even with uh, our attempts to bring new people to our planetarium staff, that astronomers just weren't available, that the problem of education in this field were, uh, were staggering. It is true even today that perhaps twice the number of astronomers as are now available could be put to good use. In the planetarium, we have tried to do our part in, in recognizing these deficiencies. We have uh, set, upon, uh, uh, set out on a program which would very seriously interest many young people into coming into this most fascinating field. We have uh, tried to do our part to... Uh, pass along the information that is constantly changing about our upper atmosphere and about space between the Earth and the Moon, as well as the far reaches of space, which have been the traditional domain of the astronomer, uh, in, in our courses in adult education. One of the most exciting educational ventures of recent years has been one uh, supported in part by the National Science Foundation, in which we have dealt with uh, high school young people of special competence. During the summer months, we have turned over our air-conditioned uh, lower-level classroom facilities to a group of 200 very fine young people. And, and incidentally, uh, we hear so much these days about uh, how badly our educational system is, is doing in the field of science. I'm sure many of the critics would be extremely pleased if they could talk to just a few of the people who had been studying astrophysics radio astronomy, basic descriptive astronomy, space science in this special summer program. I know it has been heartening to everyone on the planetarium staff who has dealt with these high school people to realize how extremely interested they are in all that's going on in this field today. I, I believe, too, that we have uh, interested enough of these young folks in astronomy uh, that we can expect uh, quite a number of astronomers from among them, and of course that was one of our purposes. It's also been very interesting to, uh, to uh, see the uh, reflection of interest in boats here at the planetarium. I suppose uh, since World War II, the number of people who have been navigating, at least in local waters and perhaps at sea too, has increased many, many times over. It certainly has, uh, the, the number of people involved in our navigation courses certainly has increased. We have had... Uh, courses, too, in space science. 
And uh, the first of these uh, followed the launching of the first satellites. So many people called and wanted to know what keeps those things up there. And when they came down, they called and wanted to know how come those things come down again. Uh, we decided to put on a course where we would try to answer these questions. The first course was attended by 380 persons, which uh, is quite a good number. Most of the courses run to about 30 persons. The interest has continued, not at the level that we reached shortly after the Sputniks and the first American satellites, too, but there is a continuing interest in this field, and this, too, is rewarding to those of us who are, are interested in science education. We have, I think, in a sense, uh, matured educationally. We see our mission as much more than one of just painting a pretty picture of the sky for people, but one that is very serious, very important. There is a need to know more about this field because it's been thrust upon us uh, dramatically by the rockets and the satellites and by the discoveries of the past few years. And uh, we, we like to think that we have uh, lived up to this challenge, but we also recognize that there's much more to do, and we're going to keep working on it. And that's just the first 25 years. Just the first 25. Thank you, Mr. Chamberlain, for taking time to review with us the 25 years of planetarium history, the first 25 years, the anniversary marked today. On behalf of our staff and the listeners, uh, let me wish you a happy birthday and our deep thanks for bringing us 25 years of knowledge and enjoyment. On the occasion of its 25th anniversary, WNBC salutes the American Museum, Hayden Planetarium. And a reminder, the 25th anniversary sky presentation at the American Museum, Hayden Planetarium, gives dramatic evidence of the changes that have taken place in the quarter century since the planetarium in New York first opened its doors to the public. The current sky show is called 20,000 Leagues Above the Seas, and it previews the launching of the first man-carrying satellite, under the great planetarium dome, audiences share the sights and sounds that the first astronaut will experience as his vehicle hurtles through airless space. Since its founding, the planetarium has kept its visitors abreast of the newest developments in astronomical discovery and space exploration. Not only in its exciting sky shows, but in the many impressive exhibits in its hall, the planetarium interprets, for interested laymen of all ages, the swiftly changing world of the astronomer and the space scientist. Why not plan a visit soon? There are several sky shows each day of the week and every evening except Monday. The American Museum Hayden Planetarium at 81st Street and Central Park West in New York City. Journey into Nature has been a special program produced by WNBC in cooperation with the American Museum of Natural History. It is based on the thousands of exhibits that are yours to see in the museum. Join us again next week as we explore the museum, seeking out the natural wonders of our world. Journey into Nature is written and directed by Alan Landsberg, produced by Steve White. Your host is Kenneth Banghart. Fred Collins speaking. This program was pre-recorded. Next Sunday, because of the broadcast of the 1960 World Series, Journey into Nature will be heard at 11.35 a.m. That's 11.35 next Sunday for Journey into Nature. WNBC and WNBC-FM, New York. How would you feel if you had to be separated from your children and had to trust to the kindness of strangers to look after them? Many parents are in that heartbreaking position through no fault of their own because of illness or accidents. Fortunately for them, there are many good, kind couples who have no children of their own at home and who welcome the chance to become foster parents. 